ekonomiskas darbības attiecīgas vērsts ir, lai ierobežotu un apturētu un novērstu Krievijas pretiesisko iebrukumu Ukrainā un arī Baltkrievijas atbalstošās darbības šīm rīcībām. Un visa informācija, kas šobrīd ir, liecina, ka šīs sankcijas drīzā laikā nevar tikt atceltas. Līdz ar to tas nav, ka mēs varam pāris nedēļas vai mēnešus, tā teikt, pārziemot šos te ierobežojumus un tad jau cerēt, ka drīzā laikā saimnieciskā darbība pagriezīsies tāpat kā bija. Es ticamā, ka jo projām teorētiski varētu notikt. Saimnieciskā darbība darījumi ar Krievijas juridiskajām personām un Baltkrievijas, taču arī šie atsevišķie gadījumi ir kaut pat reti ļoti, un arī tad, kad ir iespējami šie darījumi tīri, tehniski tīri, juridiski varbūt, tad varbūt ļoti daudz praktisks problēmas, kad šos darījumus nevar izpildīt, piemēram, Otrās puses banka ir iesaldēta, vai arī, piemēram, Krievijas valsts ir pieņēmusi kādas iekšējos ierobežojumus, kāds šobrīd ir noteikti. Līdz ar to... Sanctions, of course. So, short term, the situation most probably won't revert to what was enforced before by the sanctions. And... Uh, peace in Ukraine is essential in order to restore eventual uh, business operations. Even when uh, uh, the um, actions are possible between uh, Latvia uh, or other countries and Russia and Belarus, there are hindrances. A few words about the types of sanctions. One type of sanctions is target sanctions. There are specific restrictions against uh, uh, legal and natural persons concerning um, the uh, property and companies controlled by uh, these persons, the companies, the factories, banks. Another type of restriction which is frequently encountered the so-called sectoral sanctions against goods and services exported from Belarus and Russia, sales in the territory of Russia. All these restrictions apply when, for example, you have a, um, a store, uh, stock storage in Russia, you cannot say sell from there. There are these types of restrictions. There are also indirect sanction risks. For example, even when the goods are being delivered, for example, to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, or another country which is located close to Russia, but to the final destination of the goods is Russia, and this is a sanctioned type of goods, then um, this type of uh, transaction would be a violation of the sanctions. There's also a very recent category of the sanctions, which uh, we have not had before. These are sanctions against uh, persons from uh, Russia and uh, Belarus, who are non-residents of the EU, who don't have uh, a residence permit in uh, uh, the countries of the EU, or the European Economic Zone, or Switzerland. So the restrictions apply. 
also to the companies owned by such persons in the territory of the EU. Now, a few more words about these restrictions in order to paint a bigger picture. What are the risks um, created by the sanctions? But I won't go into great detail because we would be spending hours discussing specific restrictions. There are specific um, um, uh, natural persons and legal entities uh, who have been sanctioned. You can uh, find the list of them on uh, the web page um, I'm mentioning on the slide. And uh, uh, the list of companies where such uh, uh, persons uh, occupy certain positions can be found. So you can extrapolate uh, that to the sanctions apply. Also, trade with uh, the occupied Crimea, so Stopol, Luhansk, and uh, Donetsk is uh, uh, restricted. Of course, it's hard to imagine that any type of trade would be even possible in these territories, but it's um, obvious that right now the trade has been prohibited. It is also prohibited to export to Russia directly or indirectly, um, dual use goods and technology, as well as uh, goods and technology that can be used in defense and security. And there are different uh, categories of goods and technology for use in the aerospace industries, in maritime navigation, iron and steel products. Not all iron and steel products um, have fallen under sanctions but in the regulations, you can find the customs codes and um, uh, the representative of uh, uh, the customs is going to uh, go into greater detail on that. There is a range of uh, iron steel products which have been banned for import and export to Russia. So uh, a part of these products are prohibited from imports into the EU and most of them are banned from exports. Uh, luxury goods valued at uh, 300 euros per unit, including clothing, uh, cosmetics, beauty products, alcohol, as well as, for example, mobile phones with a value exceeding 750 euros per unit. This also applies to sports equipment, uh, a car, a luxury car, equipment, spare parts, which perhaps not um, even amount to 300 euros, but they are banned. So there is a wide range of goods uh, which cannot be exported uh, to Russia. And um, if you have them in storage already in the territory of Russia, it is uh, forbidden to sell them. And uh, there will be a few additional comments on that, because as you can see, uh, the sanctions are quite vast. When um, the war in Ukraine intensified and uh, the war crimes against the state of Ukraine um, were becoming more uh, frequent, the sanctions became harsher. and. Uh, in the Annex 23 to EU Regulation um, 833-2014, uh, there is a ban on uh, um, roses, rhododendrons, chalk, clay, uh, clothing, including secondhand uh, paint, pigments, paper, chemicals, textiles, uh, equipment. Uh, you could spend 20 minutes just uh, listing all the items to, uh, which can no longer be exported. Uh, to Russia. There's another list of what imports from Russia are prohibited. There is a transition period until August uh, for this to, uh, to be come into effect, but this applies to different uh, um, raw materials, wood, uh, cement, um, different fertilizers, different fibers, furniture, and parts thereof. Uh, these imports are prohibited from Russia. And uh, you can um, follow the customs codes because um, they explain what categories of goods fall under the sanctions. For example, when it comes to wood, uh, it is um, an umbrella category that 
uh, is covered. And there are other categories under that. Uh, customs representative is going to go into greater detail about that. It is prohibited to invest in the energy sector in Russia uh, or to participate in projects co-financed by the um, Russian Direct Investment Fund. All aircraft registered in Russia or owned or controlled by Russian uh, legal and national persons shall be prohibited from entering um, EU airspace and airfields. Uh, several Russian media have been stripped uh, of their broadcasting rights in the EU. Cooperation with these companies um, has been prohibited. These are specific companies listed in Annex 19, so not all companies, but uh, a lot of Russian companies are in this list. A lot of banks have been directly sanctioned. These are not just EU uh, sanctions, but uh, also the US sanctions. Uh, a number of Russian banks have been included in the list of the US sanctions and uh, Latvian financial uh, sector observes uh, the US sanctions pertaining to the bank sector. So transactions with these banks have been prohibited. Even uh, if your partner is not under sanctions, but um, their bank account is in the sanctioned bank, um, uh, th this means that uh, the transactions become impossible. It is also important to note that uh, operations with financial instruments um, are prohibited and um, it is prohibited to use Russian flag vessels. They are banned from uh, docking in EU ports, and this restriction also applies to those vessels that have changed flag after uh, February 24th. Uh, uh, Russian holders are also prohibited from importing goods into the EU, including in transit. Uh, this was a quick overview of the sanctions against Russia, but it's clear uh, that these sanctions are very vast. They could be easily compared with uh, uh, the sanctions imposed against North Korea, but North Korea is very much cut off from the world economy. Russia, until now, has been directly um, involved in international trade, and so these vast sanctions against Russia shall doubtless influence uh, the world more than the sanctions against North Korea, even though legally they are very similar. As regards uh, Belarus, the situation is very similar, but the sanctions have been tailored to the specifics of the situation in Belarus. Um, natural uh, persons are banned from the situation with Belarus, and also legal persons. It is also um, permitted to deliver uh, directly or indirectly uh, goods and technology, uh, which can be used uh, to strengthen uh, military and technological capacity to develop uh, the defense and security sector. There are uh, technologies uh, which hadn't been under license previously, but which can be used for military purposes. So it applies to these types of equipment and technology. There were sanctions against um, the Lukashenko regime, uh, considering um, the repressions uh, against the civil society and uh, the opposition. And those sanctions are still in force. Uh, this means that uh, the sanctions uh, against uh, importing uh, technology, tobacco goods, those are still in force. It is also prohibited during this transition period for the sanctions um, to uh, import and export different uh, types of goods. There are some transition periods that run out on June the 1st, some on July the 1st. For uh, the Russian coal, it's August, and for public tenders, um, public procurement procedures, um, the deadline is October, I think. So you have to take into account that there are different transition periods 
for uh, the contracts which had been um, signed you know, uh, before uh, the sanctions. This applies to steel works, certain rubber products, and mostly tires, pneumatic tires. It's uh, prohibited to, to import them from Belarus. Uh, all aircraft registered in Belarus um, or owned or controlled by Belarusian legal and legal persons are prohibited from using EU airspace, just like with the, the Russian aircraft. There are also uh, sanctions against the Belarusian banks and Belarusian holders. There are some uh, groups of sanctions too, which um, had not existed before. Sanctions against the so-called non-residents. These are the citizens of Russia and Belarus and legal entities um, which were uh, founded in those countries. These persons cannot have more than 100 euros in a single account with a, a single credit institution. Uh, and there are also a number of other restrictions. For example, uh, these persons cannot participate in public procurement in um, um, Latvia and in Baltic countries. There's a transition period which applies to the contracts uh, which have been uh, signed prior to um, April 9th, but uh, the transition period uh, runs out in autumn of this year. But it's uh, not possible to uh, make new agreements regarding public procurements in Latvia and in the EU anymore. This um, applies not just to these persons, but also to the companies owned by such persons. For example, in such cases when uh, there are subcontractors uh, who are uh, covering uh, a part of the procurement, the sanctions apply, and um, this cannot be done. In order to navigate uh, this um, uh, vast uh, sanctions landscape, you have to have a structured approach. This is why the Financial Industry Association has published on its web page uh, the list of five steps for companies in order to um, implement a systemic approach to apply sanctions. I won't repeat these five steps. You can um, look them up. And uh, our colleagues from uh, Bloor uh, Bank um, in uh, the presentation we'll have later uh, shall um, uh, share more insights about how uh, the procedure for following the sanctions within the company should be carried out so that the sanctions can be observed. Uh, as much as possible. In conclusion, I would like to underline that uh, circumvention of sanctions is a violation of sanctions. Therefore, the export or import of prohibited goods from Russia and Belarus via third countries, or Russia's neighboring countries, uh, with the aim of delivering them in the territory of Russia legally is considered to be a violation of sanctions. I invite you to take this into account. Even if you check that everything is fine from the point of view of the EU and uh, US uh, sanctions, there are some restrictions imposed by Russia itself uh, in its own territory. This applies to the amount of money that can exit um, Russia, not in uh, the Russian currency. And uh, there are uh, persons registered in Russia who are getting uh, these um, transactions from the EU. Uh, they are converted from euro into rubles, so there are different internal restrictions, and this can impact uh, the operations. And finally, you have to take into account that uh, payments with uh, Russia and Belarus, uh, given these um, different restrictions have become particularly complex and time consuming for uh, businesses and uh, for banks and uh, also for the state institutions such as customs. 
therefore, those payments of, uh, and transactions which are still allowed to take place between uh, EU and Russia and Belarus take a lot of time, and you should assess whether there is a positive outcome from this type of operation, these types of transactions. I would also like to underline that uh, the entrepreneurs are responsible for ensuring that their activities comply with the sanctions. Businesses are bearing the brunt of responsibility for observing the sanctions and the other regulations. This applies to Latvia and to all Baltic states. All persons are obliged to comply with uh, the EU sanctions. This means that if um, uh, within uh, business operations, the question arises, they must comply with the sanctions. This applies to the EU entrepreneurs, to Latvian entrepreneurs. Uh, the EU sanctions are binding for third countries. So uh, if a Latvian company has um, um, uh, another uh, branch you know, or a daughter company in uh, Russia and Belarus, the sanctions also apply. That would be all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to give the call to the next speaker. There are questions from the audience. Unfortunately, the signal quality is very poor and we cannot hear the question. The speaker says, I'm sorry, Lima, I cannot hear you. I will repeat the question the way I understood it, and you'll correct me if uh, I misheard something. Regarding the deliveries to Russia, those which had been planned uh, for Russia before are now being made to Turkey. Have I understood you correctly? Uh, the comment is made off microphone. Unfortunately, there is no incoming signal. The speaker says, I'm sorry, Lima, I think your microphone is off. The speaker's microphone is off. We'll have to drop this question. Hopefully, we'll be able to return to this topic in the future presentations. Thank you, Saiba. We continue with the next speaker. I would like to give the floor to the representative of uh, uh, the Expert Control Division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now it is done the head of the Export Control Division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is going to provide an explanation of the types of goods included in the sanctions and their identification. Unfortunately, the signal quality is very poor and it is impossible to hear the speaker. Unfortunately, the signal quality is too poor and we cannot hear the speaker. Thank you. 
Ugnes var izmantot kaut kādo ķīmisko ieroču ražošanā. Protams, tādas preces iegādājas arī ķīmiskās ražotnes, laboratorijas, zāļu ražotāji. Taču ikdienā jūs nekur šādas lietas veikalā neieiesiet un nenopirksiet. Tas ir kā piemērs, ja jums iet sūknes, jūs varat noskaidrot, kam viņš ir domāts. Ja jūs redzat, ka viņš ir domāts tikai ūdenim un viņu izmanto kaut kur dārzā vai lauksaimniecībā, tad ne pie kādiem apstākļiem viņš neiekritīs pie diviādu lietojuma preces. Jo parastus sūkņus nekad neviens neražos no niķeļa vai titāna vai cirkonī, tas būs pārāk dārgi un neviens tādus sūkņus vienkārši nepirks. Vēl viens piemērs ir piemēram optiskās komponentes. Jūs redzat, te ir komponentes, kas ražotas no cinka selenīda vai cinka sulfīda, un kurām ir konkrēti parametri tehniskie. Un jāpiemina, ka Kain Kots nav spējīgs identificēt cinka selenīda tādas lēcas, kuras ir tilpumā pārsniedz 100 kubik centimetrs. Tieši tādēļ ļoti daudzām lēcām vienkārši Kain Kots izkritīt. Ja jums ir kaut kādas stikla lēcas, piemēram, kas ir domātas brīvlēm, tad jums nav jāuztraucās un jāpārbauda viņas pie mums, jo tās lēcas mēs izmantojam ikdienā. Tās ir domātas tiešām, lai ir redzēta. 
viņas nekādā veidā nevar izmantot militārā, militārā ražošanai. Kā piemēram, šīs lēcas tieši ir domātas militārā ražošanai, tai pat laikā arī priekš uh, civilās ražošanas, ja mēs runājam par ļoti augstvērtīgām civilām tehnoloģijām. Teiksim, šīs lēcas ir ļoti izturīgas un viņas izmanto, uh, izmanto uh, priekš uh, kamerām, kuras ir domātas, piemēram, tādiem droniem vai satelītiem, viņas ir iztur augstu temperatūru un tam līdzīgi. Tikai tādēļ viņas jau var uzskatīt par strateģiskām un tādām, ko izmanto militārai ražošanai. Lai jūs vispār saprastu, kādā veidā to sarakstu mēs izveidojam, tad viņš veidojās no četrām dažādām starptautiskām organizācijām. Tās ir brīvprātīgas organizācijas, kurās ir kā nu kurā, ap 50 dalību valstīm dažādām. Un šo sarakstu taisa tiešām eksperti, kas ir eksperti savā jomā, kas reizi gadā sanāk visu kopā un izvēlās tad tehniski, kurā brīdī kād, kāds priekšmats pēc tehniskiem parametriem jau būs stratēģis. Tā viena no grupām ir Austrālijas grupa, viņi strādā tikai ar ķīmiskiem un bioloģiskām vielām. Viss tas, ko var izmantot gan civilā rūpniecībā, gan viss tas, kas, ko izmanto bioloģisko un ķīmisko ieroču ražošanai. Tas ir tiešām preces, kuras vajag gan, gan, gan civiliem tirgumu, gan militāriem. Preces, lai šo kodo staciju apkalpot. Lai viņa funkcionētu, lai viņa strādātu, tie būs dažādi reaktori, tie būs grafīta stieņi, kas nodrošina reakcijas enerģētiskās. Bet tajā pat laikā, ja kura civila kodā, par militāru tikai tādēļ, ka tās izai vielas, kas rodās uh, civilai elektrības ražošanai, viņas jau var izmantot militārām vajadzībām. Tas ir iemesls, kāpēc tur ir saliktas savas tehnoloģijas, kuras būtu jāuzmena attiecībās kodo lietā. Vēl viena grupa ir atšķiršu tehnoloģijas grupa. Uh, tur atkal ir tieši tas pats divajādu lietojumu preces vajadzīgas tieši ir atšķiršu ražošanai. Un pēdējā ir vasarnāras vienošanās grupa, tā ir atkal ar tādām precēm, kuras, ražoda, kuras nepieciešams, lai ražotu gan civilās, gan militārās preces jau konkrēti. Ejot cauri sarakstam, šis saraksts sastāv no desmit dažādām kategorijām, un vienkārši tā īsumā apskatīsimies, lai jums būtu skaidrs, kas tur ir iekšā. Tad nu tā kategorija sastāv tikai no lietām, kas vajadzīgas kodola ražošanai. Tur būs viss, kas ir nepieciešams kodola reaktoriem. Dažādi sūkņi, kas spēj izturēt radiāciju, dažādas iekārtas, pat ja tie ir kabeļi, kas iztur radiāciju, tad viņš tajā brīdī varētu būt šajā kategorijā. Šeit, protams, jāpiemin, ka runa nav par radioaktīvām vienām. Ir reizes, kad cilvēki domā, ka radioaktīvā viela, automātiski skaitās stratēģiska. Tad tā īsti nav. Radioaktīvs var būt arī jebkāds dzelzs gabals, kurš ir atradies kādā radiācijas zonā, un viņš vienkārši kļūst radioaktīvs. Šeit mēs runām jau par lietām, kuras vajadzīgs, lai ražotu kodo preces. Un ja mēs paskatāmies uz tiem pāris punktiem, tie, protams, tas nav viss, kas sarakstā ir minēts, bet paskatoties uz tiem punktiem, Ticiet man, jūs to neko nenopirksiet iejot veiklā. Tādas lietas ražo tikai uz pēc pasūtījumiem. Nākamā kategorija jau ir materiāli un iekārtas. Ja tā paskatās uz to sarakstu, viņš ir diezgan loģisks, jo, ja jūs gribētu saražot tanku, piemēram, jums ir nepieciešams, kas jums vajag materiāls, jums vajag iekārtas rūpniecības, Jums vajag darba gaudz, kas kaut ko virpo frēzē, tālāk jums vajag elektroniku, tālāk jums vajag vadības sistēmas, datori sistēmas. Un, principā tas saraksts sastāv no tāda liela komplekta, kas ir nepieciešams, lai pašam sāktu ražot militārās preces piemēram. Tālāk pirmā kategorija jau ir vairāk ir runa par tikai materiāliem un ķīmiskām dažādām vielām. Viena no lietām, ko mēs ikdienā pārbaudam, ir antibiotikas, medicīnas preprāti, 
Un tas viss ir ļoti lieki un ne, nav nepieciešami sūtīt uz pārbaudu, jo vienkārši nekad dzīvē ne vieni medikamenti nav bijuši ne sankcijās, ne stratēģiski. Pat, ja medikamentas ir nāk ar kaut kādu ļoti jocīgu uh businessmen can just google it and look what things are there are different uh, chemical names for different uh, objects you can call water h2o you can uh, call different types of medications by using uh, the names of chemical substances and some people don't find it very clear but uh, by googling you can just uh, figure out whether this is a medication intended uh, for humans or for animals and um, if it's a medication then don't send it for a check because there is no risk speaking of different metals every metal is being controlled considering the uh, particularities and where it can be used there are different powders such as aluminum which can be used in um, uh, rocket uh, fuel this is why they are controlled Even if you see aluminum powder, quite often it won't be for dual use because it has to be uh, a perfect uh, sphere, every grain. This is necessary for good uh, burning reaction because you know that all the rockets are using uh, these uh, types of fuel. No one is using diesel for rockets. There are different liquid gases or different metal powders. But you shouldn't worry about a regular iron. Quite often different um, uh, types of stainless steels are sent uh, for verification, stainless steel or iron. And then uh, the verification is quite excessive because iron is not used for military purposes. This requires titanium, nickel, aluminum, something like that. Quite um, frequently, um, clothing is set for uh, verifications, gloves, boots, but clothes can be strategic only if it's used for chemical production, for example. So you need special type of clothing in order to protect yourself from chemical substances from chemical gases and only this type of um, uh, clothing is considered to be dual use any item of clothing which has no particular defense against chemicals if it's not protected against gases maybe a gas mask it cannot be strategic in uh, uh, chemical production, regular types of clothing will be used. Another category, metal processing. Here we are discussing different types of equipment necessary to perform uh, actions. What is being sent uh, for verification? Equipment for wood production. I assure you, neither party is um, so hard up for military goods to begin to use wood for military purposes. Wood is wood. And any type of equipment used for wood treatment cannot be used for military purposes. So here we can uh, um, only discussing extremely uh, precise machinery used for uh, metal The link to uh, military production is very clear. If uh, we produce, for example, bicycles, these details need to be very precise. Yes, we are going 30 kilometers an hour on our bicycle. And uh, with uh, these types of vibrations and speeds, the uh, mechanical details can uh, be imprecise. It's impossible to produce uh, things to perfection. There will always be some kind of a one millimeter deviation. 
And here we are speaking about the control of uh, those types of tools and equipment that can uh, produce to extremely high precision, one thousandth of a millimeter. This type of equipment is extremely expensive. It's a uh, equipment that uh, is not being produced in China, for example, because China does not have the technology to produce this type of machinery. We won't be able to go over all the categories. So I'll move on to different images because the images will illustrate what dual use um, objects look like. The first thing that you need to remember you need and send for a verification um, objects for daily use. They have never been strategic. One example, a workbench. Uh, these types of workbenches are, uh, uh, frankly, uh, very big. They can be as big as a room. Uh, they can be transported by multiple trucks. But what does uh, this uh, type of equipment do? It uh, creates um, precisely made items. If you are making um, items for military goods, you cannot um, afford to use uh, details with mistakes because a vibration uh, which um, uh, is created when the, the precisely can be detrimental. This is the reason why um, different hand tools, hand drills, uh, different saws are being checked, uh, sent for verification to be checked because we are only controlling the workbenches uh, that are highly precise. You need to uh, worry about uh, hand tools because no military factory is going to use hand drills or hand saws for military equipment. Another example, an isostatic press. This type of equipment is um, an not even a press in uh, itself. It's more like an oven. And uh, you need it in order to create very big details without seams. For example, um, bicycle frames uh, are being welded in some places. And uh, there, uh, the point of joining is um, the place where potential defects can occur. If you need something to be very resilient, it has to be whole. You cannot uh, uh, compose it out of multiple elements, screw it together, weld it together, because uh, uh, these are potential um, vulnerable points for defects. This is why such um, ovens are being used. Uh, um, furnaces, you can create a very big detail of composition. Another example, vibration testing machine. We cannot buy them in shops. You really need to know where to find one, where to get one. Uh, they are being used to check from um, operating with with the course, uh, the uh, detail or functional. And uh, uh, for example, uh, vibrations at uh, kind of 11 kilometers is something to be checked for. Another example, centrifugal separator. We are controlling them because um, uh, they are necessary to you uh, with uh, biological agents. If you are an institution producing biological weapons, you need this type of equipment. Looking at these images, you can clearly see that these dual use objects are not uh, objects for daily use. We don't see them day to day, we cannot buy them freely. And you need to send for verification just everything that you can see where you will spot them. Uh, a potential risk. Another example, a protective suit. This uh, is a, a type of, of clothing for dual use. It uh, protects you from 
or regular chemical substances like smoke, uh, gas uh, of chemical origin it can also protect biological weapons and even uh, uh, nuclear radiation. So only this type of equipment can be of dual use and I think it uh, costs uh, 15, 20,000 per unit. So the price is also a criterion which can suggest the item is for dual use. Here is an example of a biological safety cabinet. Uh, those are for pharmacy companies. Uh, these are completely sealed chambers where you can securely work with different viruses and biological agents. At the same time, biological safety cabinets can be needed uh, for those who want to use biological weapons. Spray equipment. This is not an example of something that is controlled. It's just a general example. This is a general spray um, system. Spray equipment uh, can be used to uh, spray water or um, fertilizers, but it can also be used to spray uh, by chemical weapons. So if we want to use a chemical weapon, we want to uh, kill uh, or the harvest, it's uh, an economic threat, it's a chemical attack, it leaves the country without harvest. In order to do that, you need these types of spraying aerosol equipment. Another example, a block of graphite. We know that graphite is used to produce pencils and uh, also fishing rods, but also uh, graphite can be used uh, to create a graphite um, rods for uh, nuclear plants, so here you can see that military use. If you see graphite blocks, you can safely send them for verification to make sure that this is something uh, to be there. Another example, microchips. Most of them are made with a, a silicon, but uh, those that are made with the gallium arsenide are controlled. This is uh, something of interest for Russia and Belarus. In many examples, we see that the rockets are using uh, Soviet era uh, microchips, so those rockets are not very precise and they cannot fly uh, at uh, the necessary distances. Another example you will use um, unmanned aerial vehicles. If you work with them, uh, daily and you know that it uh, can be of dual use if you um, uh, can fly uh, for longer than one hour or it can be for more than 30 minutes and is capable of uh, surmounting 46.3 kilometers per hour wind gusts. There can be dual use items um, on the base of uh, technical specifications, but there are also other things. Of course, we know that Camas is a heavy duty car that can be used to transport uh, milk or sand, but at the same time, uh, the spare parts of um, these cars can be used um, for military purposes. Camas uh, cars can be used uh, for military use in general, they can be used to transport military equipment. So if um, uh, there's a spare part being sent for use uh, in a military model, then you can demand a license. I see that my time is running out. So here are a few examples of items that um, may attract special attention. They are fairly simple, but they have been sanctioned because uh, technologies that can be used for the military uh, here feature an, a number of uh, good subject licensing. One of the items, electronics, chips, diodes, transistors, all kinds. If you're working with electronics, you should be prudent because um, a lot of it can be banned. Uh, so it's possible, please avoid taking on such cargoes. 
spare parts for ships, including yachts and even motor boats. You can identify these items yourself. We can tell you that uh, these uh, uh, things are subject to licensing. It does not matter whether the boat is um, civilian or military use. We need to have a permission. Diving equipment, all kinds. Ship navigation equipment. One of the uh, items uh, that can be uh, frequently sent uh, to Latvia, routers and servers. Uh, I'm not referring to switches for home use, which um, are being used to, to provide uh, internet in the households. This um, applies to business grade routers, larger scale routers, which can be used to, to make telecommunications for a company. These types of can be found in lists, servers, routers, you can send them for checking. Frankly, lately, I don't see uh, very many uh, shipments of uh, these type of equipment. Optical telecommunication cables and spare parts for heavy vehicles. We are going to control spare parts for heavy vehicles if they are intended for vehicles with a load capacity exceeding nine tons. Uh, this applies to a wide range of parts. And uh, if you are in the business of transit or export or movement of spare parts, please take into account that these items can be in the sanction lists. One thing that you shouldn't send for verification is spare parts for uh, light vehicles. Uh, you only review them by pricing in specific uh, sections of the list. Next item, gas detectors and also seismological equipment. All sorts of um, explosives, even civil, are banned. So proton, TNT, all sorts. Microscopes, chromatographs, uh, spectrometers, and 3D printers. Please uh, be mindful uh, this is not applied to plastic um, 3D printers. It applies to additive manufacturing devices or metal 3D printers. Now, that would be all from me. Thank you very much for your attention, and I await your questions should you have them. Thank you very much, Nauris, for telling us about these complicated matters in an understandable way. I have no extra questions for Nauris right now, but uh, Saiba has uh, answered uh, the previous questions on Slido. I will pass on these answers to the listeners. One of the questions asked was if uh, a company uh, buys uh, metal goods from Russia and sells them to Turkey. Is it a violation of the sanctions? The correct answer is uh, that uh, Article 3G of the regulations forbids a direct or indirect uh, purchase of uh, uh, steel from Russia. So yes, in this case, the American company violates sanctions. There was also a question regarding Trans Capital Bank. Can the Latvian company receive uh, assets being sent uh, in euro? The answer is that uh, Latvian financial institutions will not uh, process the payments uh, from banks, including in OPEC, uh, not in euro, not in dollars, not in anything. Regarding repair works in um, uh, EU uh, dock ports uh, for vessels with Russian flags. Please take into account that um, with very few ex exceptions, um, ships uh, with Russian flags cannot be docked. If a specific ship has uh, the permission to be in uh, the Latvian uh, or other EU ports, then it can be repaired. Now we'll give the floor to our next speaker. Uh, who's going to uh, uh, talk about the bill of sanction clauses and uh, the role of the customs in enforcing them. I hope you can hear me. 
My name is Dr. Greenberg. I'm head of the restrictions and prohibition monitor of the uh, risk management vision of patients with diabetes. And I'll talk about the use of the restriction. What's the competence of um, uh, the customs unit and what are our challenges? Because we do have them. And uh, I'll share a few of the questions that have been frequently asked. Please uh, keep your questions for the moment because perhaps in the course of my presentation, I will already answer them. The, the main competence of the customs is sectoral sanction. This applies to the import or export of goods in the scope of the Russian, Russian sanctions. Uh, these are the goods uh, we can come on the list. The regulation of the sanction is not directly linked to uh, the definition. So import and export is not something that is normally meant with these words. Um, it's the uh, incoming transit and exit. And there are no exceptions to natural persons. Uh, sanctions apply to luggage and uh, mail. But before we move on to that, I invite you to say yes to reading the regulations. Why? Because of all the conditions, all the exceptions, and the general picture can be found in the regulation text. And everyone can find the information regarding uh, their goods and services. Now, a few words about the things that we are rolling. This is a simplified overview of the regulation, what is being restricted, what cannot be exported. In both regulations regarding Russia and Belarus, the deadline for contract um, are indicated. For example, when it uh, comes to aircraft uh, spare parts, uh, the deadline has already run out. What happens in this case? Exports are not allowed. The customs declaration will be rejected. Uh, then there will be an assessment whether uh, criminal liability arises here for the attempt. When it comes uh, to imports, you see the same conditions uh, regarding the completion of contracts. I won't list all the codes because it will take ages. There are uh, frequent questions about the letters X. What does it mean? If you don't know, this means that this group of goods uh, uh, is subject to regulations with some exceptions. So you have to uh, read carefully, you have to review annex or the text itself. There will be all the information regarding what uh, these um, prohibitions apply to. The fifth round of sanctions have brought additional conditions regarding the transportation or vessels and uh, road transport was a great challenge for us because uh, we have uh, borders with uh, Russia and Belarus and uh, us are uh, crossing the border quite a lot. Uh, this uh, prohibition has exemption for uh, regular um, mail. Uh, uh, Belarusian mail is delivering mail through address. Ukrainian uh, and there are also examples for uh, transit uh, between Russia and Leningrad uh, oblast, but this only um, applies provided that the carriage of such goods is not otherwise under this regulation. There are exemptions provided for Russian vessels and Russian transport. But right now, that does not apply because we do not know 
who is the authority that can decide on the application of exemptions. There's, um, there is a condition, a necessary condition. If, for example, the receiver is in Germany, we should be able to understand that these exempt goods are truly necessary for the German market. So right now we are not applying exemptions. Now, when it comes to Belarus, the latest uh, round of sanctions uh, has quite a lot of items. I will be a very general overview because the restrictions for road transport apply to Belarus as well. The exemptions are provided for um, mail. I would like to add that when it comes uh, to diplomatic cargo, we apply exemptions because uh, the mission provides information uh, how uh, the permission is going to be formatted, how the How are we controlling? The customs make selections and referrals as automated as possible, so we access contract, origin, other features. If, if something is not clear to us, whether the goods are sanctioned, we solicit additional information. In case of a breach of sanctions or special breach of sanctions, the customs procedure is um, not allowed to be completed, the bond is rejected, and the uh, criminal offense is assessed. Uh, another customs procedure may be applied um, because uh, important goods are just rejected uh, back to the country from which they are put in. You can also send it back to China. Uh, we cooperate with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the assessment of dual items. And uh, we cooperate with the national security services and other authorities, including EU customs services. There's a very accurate information regarding the project. And we are monitoring the onward movement of goods to make sure that no circumvention of sanctions occurs, that the owners are not changed, that everything can be tracked down. Sources of information or the customs, the main source of information is the customs declaration and the accompanying documents. But additional information can be requested, and uh, an important additional uh, source uh, information information is our uh, tariff system. Those who work in import and export are familiar with this system. Most likely, they are using this system. They know what is uh, written there. For those uh, who perhaps uh, don't know the matter very well, I have uh, chosen one of the codes to provide an illustrative example. What do we see here? This is the um, specific code from the group. We know that group 44 um, from uh, Belarus is uh, banned. All the codes with the, uh, the first numbers before are now under sanctions. We see the country, and here we see where are the conditions uh, of sanctions. There is an indication in uh, which article we should. Uh, look for the conditions. The conditions section enables us to see whether there are exemptions. Here we see that there are exemptions applying uh, to specific contracts. And finally, you can um, examine the regulatory enactments. There is a link. You can click on it and find the relevant article.
I would like to say that sanctions are just one measure that um, uh, have to be verified because there are also um, other things to be done, external uh, control, a connection with uh, uh, parties, cesium, presence, and so on. So a, a lot of uh, points need to be reviewed. What are other additional sources? Specific laws. Here, your lex is our best friend, particularly the function to find consolidated regulatory actions. Of course, in the beginning, it was uh, fairly difficult because they had to repeat everything separately. But uh, right now, it's um, all right. You can find the latest amendments very easily. I invite you to uh, look up the sanctions on the web page of the Ministry of uh, Affairs. There are also frequently asked questions. We do have uh, included a section regarding the restrictions and uh, prohibition for the movement of goods. The, the very general information is available. I remind you that uh, you need to uh, look for the information that is relevant to you and you will type of in the integrated uh, tariff management system and in the regulation itself. What are the challenges for the customs? Main challenges arise from the fact that right now the customs rule is not defined in national legislation. Obviously, working with goods is uh, directly related to our duties. But um, uh, the large volume of goods subject to sanctions impacts our work. Uh, we cannot uh, check everything automatically, manually but necessary. And uh, a customs uh, is um, forced to spend a lot of time verifying deadlines, creates additional stress. We don't know who the competent authority is because um, uh, there are some places in the regulation where it's clear who the competent authority is. Sometimes it's not. These uh, verification procedures are important not just on the border but also during the input procedure. Right now, we have been. Uh, late for three days and uh, um, this creates a revetment that I invite um, people to understanding we cannot um, prevent us we try to redirect our employees but uh, we cannot uh, decrease the number of checks necessary so to um, do everything even though the checks weren't used. What are the current uncertainties? We yeah, have uh, highlighted only the most fashionable things. Conditions of contract. There are a lot of contracts which need to be fulfilled and and there is um, a great desire to prove that uh, the contract was indeed signed before the date specified, but it's not always true. The, uh, Subject matter and price are essential items of the contract, but date and place of the delivery are not essential elements. If um, subject matter and price are changed, we are um, considering this an essential element. And if the additional contract is uh, concluded for a new price and a new um, subject uh, new item, we consider it to be a separate contract. For quicker results, please add uh, the contracts. If you have contact with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs regarding uh, the dual items, and you have uh, the decision of uh, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, please add it to your customs declaration. Don't wait for the customs to invite you to do that. Because um, uh, when uh, 
uh, you wait for the customs to invite you to submit initial information, you just get into the second queue and you have to wait again. I also draw your attention to the fact that uh, customs does not grant exceptions for road uh, transport or port calls by Russian flag vessels in the sanctions regime because the uh, need of the receipt for the category of goods is not known by us. That would be all from me. I tried to touch upon the most general um, matters, give you a um, general overview of the way customs work right now with this vast scope and volume of goods which have fallen into the sanctions. Thank you very much for your exhaustive presentation. No questions from the audience on this matter. We'll continue with our next speaker, member of the board of your uh, bank, Igor Petrov. He is going to share his insights uh, regarding managing the risk of sanctions in companies. Thank you. I represent the bank and the Financial Industry Association, but today I would not like to speak as a banker. I would like to share my vision how uh, uh, sanctions managed procedure can be created in companies. We have had experience in creating internal mechanisms um, in different frameworks, and I hope the experience and vision will be useful to you. This is not the only way in which uh, this kind of control can be created, but this airway. When I started my career in the domain of sanction, sanction compliance, uh, this was uh, back in 2002. Sanctions were a mystical matter of Korea, Cuba. It very detached from reality. But um, in 2014, yeah, I made an error in my presentation. I meant 2014. There, uh, there were different um, sanctions pertaining uh, to different sectors. They played an increasingly important role uh, regarding business with Russia. In June last year, after the Belarusian elections, there was um, a large uh, pack of sanctions against Belarus. And of course, for all of us, uh, 24 February 2022 is a very tragic date, a very meaningful date. It uh, has impacted all of our lives. Many feel it now already. Many will feeling it in the coming days. Uh, life has changed, the rules of the game have changed, and the business environment has changed, particularly when it comes to import and export Russia and Belarus. I understood uh, the viewpoint of a businessman. I was able to do that because for you previously, sanctions used to be intangible. Then it became more and more tangible, more and more familiar. Payments are not coming in, partners are asking things, uh, a lack of information. Right now, perhaps we have even too much information, so many seminars, so many lectures, so many clarifications, questions and answers. We're being flooded with this information. It's very interesting. It's very significant. But what is the most important thing? How can we navigate this information? I will try to offer you a way uh, in which we can create a form of management of sanctions risk. Cyber, in the beginning of uh, our event mentioned the article on five steps. It's a, a very good article. I invite you to read it on the web page. And uh, it all boils down to a systemic approach and documenting the matters. A risk assessment, a decreasing risk or 
uh, avoiding risk, systematizing necessary information, verifying your business partners and other involved parties, and verifying goods. Let's start with the systemic approach. Few sanctions arrived in our lives very quickly. They built part of change, and they won't go away anytime soon. Legal regulations on sanctions are usually adopted for 12 months, but uh, nothing will happen after 12 months. Perhaps there will be some changes. There might be even uh, harsher measures. There might be milder measures, uh, depending on situation. But uh, going forward, there won't be a way when all the sanctions are just up and cancel. The sanctions are adopted until they are uh, called off, and uh, this uh, means a longer period of time awaiting positive change. So managing the risk of sanctions is not uh, um, a measure for a single day. You think about it, you note it, and you move on. There are going to be new sanctions. There uh, might be some uh, lessening of sanctions. There might be new partners coming in. Working with them, you need to check for the risk of sanctions. Maybe you need to introduce changes to your existing partner structure. Maybe uh, there is a change of ownership. You need to change who the new owners are, who the beneficiaries are. Are they under sanctions? Of course, uh, your business is um, developing and you have the opportunity to uh, look for new directions, new opportunities, but uh, be mindful of the risk. All people in Latvia, all businessmen registered and located in um, Latvia are subjects uh, of uh, sanctions. We need to observe sanctions. It applies to all of us. Now, a few words on the documenting process. Even if you have a wonderful understanding of the sanctions and you can manage sanctions perfectly, you can avoid things as partners, choose only the uh, good ones, secure uh, goods. But if you don't have documents proving that, it means you have nothing. So I invite you to have a more bureaucratic approach. I know that uh, nobody likes uh, bureaucracy, except maybe banks, but they don't like it very much either. Sanctions uh, uh, require bureaucracy in order to function. So I invite you to document everything that you do. Please document how you manage the risk. I don't suggest that you need to write long documents uh, for strategic policies if it's not something that's a feature of your business. You don't have to buy um, external document packages if you don't plan to implement it in practice. That's useless. I suggest that uh, you write on a piece of paper what are your steps to manage the sanctions risk of the company? What is your risk assessment? How are you going to assess your partners? How are you going to verify the good? Uh, what the goods require permission of, from the ministry? And keep these documents archived. Be ready to show these documents when uh, there's an auditor or a financial institution asking for them. Risk assessment. Companies uh, might have um, a different exposure to risk. If you have um, a store that is uh, buying uh, products in Latvia and selling them only in Latvia, then perhaps uh, there is no risk. But if you are involved in international trade, uh, particularly with Russia and Belarus, then it's a risk. And uh, transporting, moving the goods is also 
uh, quite a hassle right now. So you need to uh, have an assessment of potential risks that these applications fail. It's a logical operation. Write down who your partners are, uh, who are uh, high risk partners, depending on where they are located, what are the risk product categories. Maybe out of 100 items that you sell, you have just one that uh, requires a permission from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You need to provide some sort of assessment and you need to document. And of course, after the risk assessment, the next important thing that you mustn't forget is uh, considering how you can decrease your risk. For example, if out of 100 items, only one is subject to risk, maybe you should just drop this item. If out of 10 partners, you have one who is from a sanctioned country, but you can find an airlock partner in the EU, maybe uh, there is no point in creating a complicating system, uh, thinking uh, whether uh, you'll be able to make payments, uh, uh, when, whether there will be additional complicated procedures in the customs. Maybe you can just drop this part. I think um, no one expects that uh, in the very near future there will be any the sanctions. I'm sure there will be new uh, rounds of sanctions and it will become increasingly more complicated to cooperate with these countries. So we invite you to assess whether you can give up on these risky uh, transactions. It's not always possible. Should this be impossible, maybe you can decrease the risk by decreasing the number of parts, decreasing the movement of goods. Because the less cooperation you have with these countries, the better it is for your business right yeah. now. What else can I say? Systematization. Yeah. Regarding uh, the systematization of useful information, during this seminar, you have heard a lot about the, uh, the sources of information on the sanctioned persons, uh, the owners and beneficiaries of businesses from Russia and Belarus. And I'm sure that you have already heard a lot during previous seminars about information in other articles. Just try to systematize the information you have available. No one single seminar is going to provide you with an answer that is perfectly tailor-made for your business. We are trying to cover a wide range of topics. You will most likely have one specific question that you would like to focus on. And I invite you to try to find a question that is useful to you in particular. Please put this information down in a, in a journal document or in an email at least. So when you have a new partner coming in, you don't need to start all over again. You immediately have all this uh, useful information in a single checklist that you can immediately use. More about this useful information. Uh, the sanction search engines are very interesting tools, as mentioned in uh, the presentations by my colleagues. There are different aggregators, there are legal companies uh, aggregating and publishing information, there are different, different articles, for example, in Delphi. I invite you to uh, start by reading the regulation, because that is the original, that is the source. That is uh, at the source of all the restrictions. Uh, it uh, determines uh, who is uh, uh, doing things. You can find all of the codes in the regulation. Latvian uh, regulation suggests who is liable and so on, but the codes, uh, these specifications, they can be found in the regulation. I invite you to read the regulation in order to assess whether your uh, transactions, whether your part are subject to the sanctions. Uh, the EU regulations are available in all the official languages of the EU, but I suggest that you read it in English because um, sometimes there are uh, issues with the translation. Of course, you can read it in Latin as well. 
uh, verifying your business partners and other involved parties. I think we have spoken enough on this matter, but I would like to remind you that uh, you should write down who your partners are, with whom you cooperate, uh, figure out uh, where they're registered, where they have uh, their bank accounts, or whether it will be possible to continue bank transactions with them, whether their banks have fallen under sanctions, check who are the true beneficiaries of these uh, companies, who are the shareholders, are the shareholders on the sanctions list. And I also invite you to regularly, because you can uh, check your partner, and then a while uh, later they sell their company to a person who is under the sanctions. So you should document how frequently you perform your checks. When it comes to um, checking the goods, the procedure is the same. You know what types of goods you're working with, which are the goods uh, without any restrictions, which are the goods that uh, with restrictions, the permission from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is necessary for those categories. Okay. You know all that. Working with your partners, you need to be mindful as well. When they are from sanctioned countries, please um, document uh, the dates for uh, your contract signings. This is something uh, that is uh, quite topical. When there is a new round of sanctions, new restrictions uh, for imports from Russia and Belarus, there is a transition period to uh, complete the obligations for old contracts. But it does not mean that you are going to conclude uh, um, agreement and uh, sign a contract uh, backdating it. No, don't do that. And if you are working with Russia and Belarus, keep a register where you note uh, the dates and uh, you should have a uh, mechanism for verifying it, maybe a chronic signature, so you can uh, prove to the customs that it was truly an old contract that you are not trying to uh, squeeze in a new contract with um, uh, uh, some backdating scheming. It's not a matter of trust or a lack of trust. It's a matter of risk management, risk assessment, and decreasing the risk for all parties. What are you going to gain if you create a system to manage the risk of sanctions. Of course, first and foremost, you're going to manage the risk more efficiently, save your time and money. You won't be afraid that um, you'll potentially violate some sanctions. Your business activities always um, entail some repetitive actions. There are processes that you repeat uh, time and time again. and uh, in that case, uh, it's good to have it um, tailor-made and um, well-planned from the start. Determine who is the responsible person, determine what is the procedure, do it once, and uh, you'll have uh, the sanctions period covered. You ha have to adapt to the changing circumstances, new rounds of sanctions, maybe lessening of some sanctions eventually, Maybe you'll change the geography of your operations, you'll have two partners, you'll begin working with new products. Um, having a document and the system is going to help you uh, in all these actions. It will also decrease your dependency on people because um, you will have one specialist who knows all about sanctions. This is a risky situation uh, where you depend on one person a lot. Potentially, 
uh, risk management system will improve your relationship with your partners and state institutions. Of course, even if you have a perfect management system, it is not a guarantee that um, uh, your bank will allow you to do everything, but it will surely help you to maintain a good relationship with your bank. And uh, if we refer to uh, the darker side of things, if you have accidentally violated sanctions, maybe you have a new partner, you check everything, it seems fine, you have the transaction, and then two days later, you find out that they changed shareholders, um, the shareholder is now on the sanctions list, so you have violated the sanctions. In this case, if you see that you have a risk management system, you see that you made a mistake, it will help you to decrease the negative consequences. These are very elementary measures, but they are helpful. And I'm sure that a lot of you have already worked on um, developing such a systemic approach. And you can learn things by doing. That would be all for me for today. If you have any questions, I would Thank you very much for your useful uh, suggestions. Then one question, I will ask it again, even though it goes back uh, to other matters. Is a Lorsopt, um, Lorsopt Gnosis enough to uh, check uh, the state of your partner? I would say that in the case of sanctions risk, you should go deeper, uh, test uh, the waters uh, more carefully, figure out who is the uh, owner, who are the shareholders, and try extra hard to check all the Thank you. In, in case uh, the sanctioned person uh, owns a uh, uh, few shares in um, uh, the company, uh, should we drop the uh, operation? In case uh, the person can control the operations of uh, the company, so they are a member of the board and the shareholder, then we should uh, terminate uh, the relationship. If uh, the share is insignificant and uh, other uh, persons are on the board, it depends on your risk appetite. You are not obligated to terminate relationships, but think about it on your own. Another question, luxury goods uh, bought from China and sold in Russia. Are the sanctions uh, applicable in this case? Yes, since uh, the company in question was founded in Latvia, the ban to export luxury goods to Russia is applicable to this Latvian company uh, who buys in China and sells in Russia. Thank you, Igor. And now we give the floor to the next speaker, Edward Grassis, who is a risk management at PIT. He will be sharing his insights into uh, supply chain and uh, cooperation partner analysis for uh, the input and export. Yes, I would like to give you a theoretical overview of the things that should be done. How we can examine the situation with the clients, what are the risks? Igors has just said that you need to create a risk assessment document. I will try to outline what are the main points uh, and how we can uh, examine the situation with our cooperation partners. There are four key elements for the standard clients and cooperation partners, the risks that um, are typical for them, considering the legal form of uh, this geographical risks, 
related to the location and supply chain. Then specific uh, goods and services. And uh, the distribution channels, the risk related to payments and uh, using intermediaries. It's important to assess the risks that are not just related to direct supplies, but also other participants uh, of the supply chain, intermediaries, uh, providers of payments, and other parties. This um, is related not just to uh, direct sanctions, but also the risks of uh, circumvention of uh, sanctions. As regards the risks, what are the main principles? The main idea is that we need to figure out what are the principles of um, cooperation, legal form uh, of uh, uh, property ownership, economic area, verifying sanctions list, and um, accessing topical information about uh, the cooperation partners. Is there any negative information available? These are the main points we should figure out. If any type of public information is available about the financial situation, the area of operations, reputation, and it decreases the risk. And if the public information is not available, it increases the risk. It means that it's more difficult to make sure who uh, is behind the partner. What should we identify during our cooperation? Please look uh, not just on a very superficial level, what is uh, the economic operations, but try to gain detailed information about the cooperation partner. What are they doing? The first step, sanction. Uh, check sanction screening, look um, into the lists, uh, check uh, for compliance. If uh, you see that uh, uh, the person is not on, uh, no persons are on the sanctions list, we can move further. Uh, see how the client organizes their economic or personal operations, what is the place of economic operations, do uh, they have uh, accounts uh, in uh, other financial institutions, are there uh, opportunities to uh, sell your goods, do you have information how many employees they have, the infrastructure, is it possible to buy or sell these types of goods? This can um, uh, be very relevant to figure out whether your partner is truly your partner or it's just an intermediary and someone is hiding behind them. What is uh, the activity or the previous periods of economic operations, the turnover, profits, partners? Does the client have a special license? Do they have a cooperation history? Uh, does it comply with uh, the general standing of uh, operations? An additional risk factor would be um, if we're a recently founded company with a large volume of important exports. This um, might be a way uh, to hide the true cooperation partner. And if you see that something is unclear, that there are some contradictory aspects, then ask for additional information.
and maybe you can decide not to cooperate with this partner. Perhaps uh, the financial institution or state institutions will ask for information about these cooperation partners anyway, so it's good if you have it in advance. This is related to different regulatory enactments, uh, the matter of geographical risks. You need to figure out whether the direct restrictions are applicable uh, in other jurisdictions question. And uh, moving on, perhaps uh, the jurisdiction has a border with another jurisdiction subject to the sanctions. Uh, neighboring countries, um, uh, the countries that are neighboring Russia and Belarus are potentially risk partners uh, because uh, there might be a good circumventing the sanctions. Uh, so uh, goods are being sent to these countries with the aim to further sell them. Another important uh, matter is um, uh, if the jurisdiction has a border with the uh, a, a sea border, a maritime border with a jurisdiction subject to the sanctions, not just the land border. This uh, increases the potential risk. Therefore, so as my colleagues have said, there are different ways in which the sanctions can be avoided um, and uh, you have to um, make sure that you don't fall for these uh, risks uh, of your partner's potential trying to circumvent the sanctions by using you. All of these things are extremely relevant. What are the principles for the assessment of geographical risks? It entails different elements. For example, you can have um, uh, a company in um, uh, the EU, but it has uh, uh, a connection with another country. You can observe uh, the scheme on the slide with potential risk factors. I advise you to be as prudent as possible right now. You have to be more careful and please document all the maps. What uh, should you describe uh, as diligently as possible when you are performing the geographic risk assessment? Uh, look for the registration um, location of the client, uh, the jurisdiction of their activity, uh, the usage of a bank account. Is there a connection with other jurisdictions um, bordering uh, the sanctioned countries? Perhaps uh, a scheme to circumvent the sections uh, is being planned by other parties. Is there a land border or a maritime border? Uh, is uh, the import and export of uh, uh, the specific goods typical for the kind of geographic location in question? Is it likely uh, that uh, these uh, deals are being made in good faith? Uh, 
or this is something that um, is used to uh, resell potentially the goods to uh, the sanctioned countries. What are the principles for risk assessment of uh, goods and services? Uh, the assessment of uh, risk factors allows you to identify the deviations uh, from uh, the typical activity. And uh, you should try to figure out whether the provided products and services are linked to uh, the economic operations of the client. It's a uh, link. Uh, with the dual use of products or military uh, sphere place uh, is uh, your cooperation regular what are the conditions of operations uh, are the types of goods and services specified what are the volumes does this comply with the mode of delivery uh, check for make payments, check whether the sums involved in the deals are uncharacteristic high. No signal. Unfortunately, technical issues continue to plague us. We'll wait uh, uh, for Edgars to come back. I remind you that uh, the recording will be available on the web pages of um, our organization and of our partners. You'll be able to review the record and you'll be able to download the presentations. You'll be able to use them. As a, a number of our speakers have highlighted, it's very important to follow all the latest changes. Of course, it's very difficult to follow all the latest information. This is why we organize these seminars and as soon as we have latest updates, we have time to bring um, a few attention. If you spot something and you notice that there are no clarifications, uh, bring it to our attention. In a cooperation with our partners, we'll try to provide you with all the latest updates and uh, explanations. I remind you that um, the recording of this broadcast is going to be available in English, so you are welcome to share it with your cooperation partners in order to uh, discover the aspects of um, sanctions application in Latvia. Also, it would be good practice to share these insights with our neighboring countries. We have discovered that um, there can be some minor practical differences in the way the sanctions are being applied in practice. The practice is not homogenous in all of the EU, and uh, we see that in Latvia, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, interaction with different stakeholders want to make sure that the sanctions are being Looks like we'll be able to get back to Edward's presentation. Thank you very much for listening to this technical information. Edward, please continue. Yes, I hope you heard me. For some reason, Zoom refused to cooperate with me. I'll continue. Where was I? You have to re review your low risk operation partners in order to make sure that there truly is no risk. Be uh, prudent and to perform an initial risk assessment for everyone. As regards uh, high risk areas, see whether the goods and services potentially refer to the risky areas. 
this applies to uh, dual use and uh, military use uh, products. And I think our colleagues from uh, the state institutions have a great detailed overview of that. The connected industries with a heightened potential risk are of importance. Please um, examine the connection with each of them. You have to understand what is the origin of goods and services. Uh, think about uh, the uh, final receiver, whether the delivery costs are too high compared with the value of the goods. Perhaps uh, there are attempts to circumvent the sanctions to pay off someone involved in the scheme. Look at uh, the size of the goods, whether their type and uh, uh, volume correspond to the profile of the supplier, of the receiver, and to see whether there are substantial differences in the customs documents. What are the risks pertaining to the distribution channels? A direct uh, cooperation model is uh, preferable. The involvement of third parties is a potential risk factor when they come up uh, in uh, product distribution, different intermediaries, third parties. This is potentially risk payments uh, to third parties who are not contractual parties. This is not something you should allow. You need to be clear where you're paying to. You need to clearly know uh, where uh, you are delivering to uh, cash or virtual currencies are potential risk factor. Transfers uh, to or from financial institutions uh, which are subject to sanctions. All of this uh, relates to uh, the risk of potentially circumventing sanctions. Using third parties and the involvement of third parties in cooperation heightens the risk and need to examine it in depth. When it comes to assessing the distribution channel, it is important to focus on uh, the involvement of third parties and intermediaries in uh, uh, the deals or organizing them. Are there any deals with third parties or in their interests? And are these third parties subject to sanction? Are there any payments uh, deliberate to third parties? Are third parties involved in planning the deals, the payments and uh, delivery? What are the payment and supply channels? And uh, are there any discrepancies uh, between uh, the origin of goods and uh, the receiver of um, uh, financial assets? Now, about the general risks. As I have mentioned previously, it is very important to identify high risk factors and to provide good quality documentation necessary for analysis. If you are missing something or you cannot prove something uh, in writing, then you cannot prove that the risks are being understood and managed. The most typical approach is uh, to ask for documentation and to assume that if something has not been documented, then it has not been done. So you should really work on your documents in order to be able to prove what has been done. You have to identify the risk factor pertaining to the client what other goods these are, what's the origin of the client, um, what uh, actions were performed in order to assess the risk factor, what type of information and documentation was obtained pertaining to this factor, 
were there any other additional factors of lessening the risks? And uh, finally, what was the final decision regarding the uh, risk factor and the measures to be taken? Here is an illustrative example. Uh, a low risk factor client. You understand that uh, the client is not related to any risk areas, so you don't need to uh, analyze the risk in detail. Then, if uh, the client has a high risk factor on the additional steps, the good um, track here would be is if you have a high uh, risk factor client, you uh, perform a risk factor analysis, you get the additional information, and the information that is available publicly is positive. So uh, the risks pertaining to this client uh, seem to be understandable and manageable. And you can move forward. But you can have another example. When uh, the client is a high risk client, you perform a risk assessment, you don't have uh, sufficient information. The publicly available information is positive, but in order to fully understand the risk related to this client, you need extra documentation. So you should um, ask for extra information from uh, this partner. Another scenario, you have a high-risk client, you made an assessment without analyzing the specific risk factor. So you should uh, analyze uh, the risk fully. Another more practical example, potential risk of sanction because uh, the goods are being exported to Russia. You um, assess uh, the results of the sanctions check. You see no compliance. You don't find uh, compliance in uh, the list of sanctioned persons. You document that uh, the person is not subject to sanctions. You document what have done to make sure of that. You keep this information in writing about your cooperation partners in Russia, legal information, publicly available information, information obtained from the specific cooperation partner that justifies your assessment of uh, the client, the goods and services. Risk lessening factors, uh, revised financial reviews prepared by the client, uh, long standing operation with the client. This uh, testifies to the reliability as determined by the assessment. So, this potential sanction uh, risk does not uh, yield uh, potential action violations, but you need to review uh, the changes and the compliance in uh, goods and partners regularly. And this also means the supply chain. In conclusion, a few bad practice examples. The actions you perform are not based in risk. For example, if you ask for the same information from all of your cooperation partners, regardless of uh, uh, the risk and um, of uh, the de facto beneficiaries. If you ask the same of others, maybe you are not really asking about the actual risk. So your general um, request for information does not cover the actual needs. So it gives you, as a result, unnecessary information and does not give you the necessary information. 
you should focus your activity on the actual areas of risk. Another example of bad practice, trusting the qualifications from the client. You have clarifications, but you don't have the documents to prove it because your cooperation partners can be different. They can be telling you all sorts of things. They can be writing in the web page, all sorts of things. If you have no external review, or particularly when it comes to a heightened risk factors, these are insufficiently um, elaborate uh, risk assessment procedures, and they are not enough. Another example of bad practice, relying on uh, uncorroborated information too much. This is something that uh, can be told by third parties, friends of the client. Uh, your sources are uh, lacking credibility and the information has not been verified. Trusting unofficial sources and web pages is not good practice. And another example of that practice, taking information does not comply with the business profile of the client. If uh, something happens uh, that does not comply with the general uh, operations profile of the client, for example, they suddenly change their uh, type of economic activity, they're changing the turnover of the partners, they are beginning the, the new types of, of the business, they increase the volume of transactions, get new supply chain. This is a potential red flag that you need to draw your attention to. You shouldn't just assume a very general way that it's fine. If um, up to now your cooperation um, testifies uh, to a certain type of activity from uh, the operator that they are working within a geographical area, and then suddenly you see this big change, don't assume good faith. Overall, that would be all from me. I have tried to sketch out the most important factors, how you can review this control system. I would like to underline that it's very important to review the situation with your cooperation partners and to assess all the risk. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to ask them. I'm sure that your presentation has yielded useful advice. There are a few questions. If we bought uh, goods from a sanctioned uh, entity before the sanctions um, came in force, how can we return them? It's a very technical question. I think it depends what exactly happened. Was it uh, delivered a long time ago before the sanctions were applied? If uh, there is some overlap between the delivery periods and transition periods, then uh, you should examine every situation in great detail to figure out what uh, was going on. I wouldn't, wouldn't like to give you a general answer. It is something that requires a specific analysis. Thank you. I also remind you that in order to uh, make financial transactions, uh, special permissions are also needed to pay for the goods. Another question, also not very specific, about five partners. Do you have any advice about regular um, checks for these cooperation partners? So here we have a lot of partners. Yes, 500 is a substantial number. You should think about potential automatization of the process. If uh, something can be automated, uh, maybe an automated check of uh, the sanctions lists. If uh, there is, for example, a, an automated solution from Lurstoft, that should be a useful tool. Maybe this is something to think about. This uh, step uh, would be 
automated to the uh, point of uh, getting a computerized alerts if there is a positive match with a sanctions list, and this should um, make the process easier. You should also think about your risk scope and your risk appetite. So what is a standard uh, business as usual for you and uh, what is something that is out of standard? Think about uh, the risks and make sure that they're not too high. Examine uh, the situation uh, on an individual level. These would be the main points of advice uh, when you're working with a large number of partners. Thank you, Edward. This was the final question from the audience. I would like to thank all the speakers and all the listeners for their undivided attention. I also remind you that the recording of the broadcast and the presentations will be available on the web page of our organization and our partners. The current situation in the domain of sanctions is um, obviously a matter of uh, midterm and long term. We will have to be following it, manage our risk appetites, and figure out how we can protect our business and our operations from different types of risks, including in the domain of sanctions. We harshly condemn the invasion of Russia in Ukraine, and we hope that it will be able to return to a peaceful situation, that at one point, sanctions will no longer be relevant because we'll have peace and security. Thank you very much, and see you again.